A friend of mine recently sent me an article describing a girls' grammar school in Brisbane, Australia. And the title of the article goes something like this. Brisbane private school students are identifying as cats. Now, it is the current year, so none of this should surprise us. And apparently, some of the students, they're all girls, of course, are getting upset at the other students for, quote-unquote, sitting on their tails, their imaginary tails. And this is just par for the course. But I think what's interesting about this is more the analysis of how we got here and why this is occurring. Now, for the record, this isn't just make-believe and pretend, I think. It's far too prevalent, and it is, at least in the eyes of these people, far too real. Now, I was young. I was a big comic book fan as a child, and I collected comics that I could, either for earning money on errands or a small allowance. And there were times when I thought, Wolverine, for example, was a really, really cool hero. I remember I had broken my arm, and I thought at the time it would be really cool if I had Wolverine's healing factor. But it never occurred to me to identify as Wolverine. I knew and know I'm not Wolverine. And in general, and this might be simply a side effect of my own mental endowment, that is, in a negative sense, that I'm not very good at escapism. I have tried to escape reality my entire life, and usually I've failed, which is to say I'm always acutely aware of the underlying reality that undergirds everything. So this isn't a version of that. This isn't, let's pretend we're cats. This is part of a social trend, as we all know. You might have heard the term furry, fursona, this sort of nonsense. Now, the real question is, how did we get here? And why does it persist? Why is it increasing? Well, I'm not a huge fan of Christian apologetics. I'm not Christian. But there is a decent metaphor that is used by a gentleman by the name of G.K. Chesterton. And he likes to talk about something called Chesterton's fence. And the idea behind it is if you were to come across a large or long fence in a wooded area and you decide just to knock it down and destroy it, you might be, in fact, committing a grave error, which is to say you don't know the reasons behind the fence. Why was the fence erected in the first place? And generally speaking, this is applied to political discourse and politics in general, social policy, society, right? That before you get rid of certain norms and standards, in this case, maybe you should give some pause and some considerations of why they were there in the first place. And one thing that seems clear to me, and I'm not a conservative, but it's kind of obvious, nor am I religious, but again, patently obvious, that for decades now, we have done our best collectively, not as individuals, but collectively to strip away the layers of what once was referred to as normalcy, normal standards, the idea that there was some kind of standard that we could cling to and that we could orient ourselves towards. Now, sometimes that would pose a problem because we are all, to some degree, deviant. No one is perfectly aligned with whatever standard is dominant in their day and age. However, it's nonetheless useful. And the price we pay for having standards, as I mentioned, is, yeah, of course, that it's difficult. If you're deviant, too deviant, then problems can arise. But it seems to me that the price we pay for having no standards whatsoever seems to be that much greater because there's nothing to cling to. There's no flotsam, no driftwood in the ocean. It's just whatever goes. And the problem is that because it's not really an axiom, but this idea of Chesterton's fence has not been observed, and it never really is for the most part, Humans tend to innovate, look at the internet, for example, great example, in fact, and just throw things out there and then hope to the gods, pray to the gods that it works out. How has the internet really worked out? Well, in some ways it's worked out, in some ways it really hasn't. But nobody thought, hmm, life might be better without the internet. They just put it out there. 
The same is true to a much greater extent of social policy. So why are little girls and children in general very, very confused about their quote-unquote identities? I think it's pretty obvious. There are extremely flimsy standards these days of what constitutes quote-unquote normal. Now, we do spend some time on this channel talking about the normies, right? If you're watching this, you're probably not a normie, which is to say neurotypical. But nonetheless, I do think certain standards are useful. Across the board, really. For example, having a sense of what's considered artistic and aesthetic, even though there are going to be some deviations there, is useful because you can orient yourself towards that and strive for that. Having a sense of what is considered fast as opposed to slow is useful. So we're really boiling this down to the utility of it all, which is basically what Chesterton's fence is about. It's the utility behind the concept. Of course, Chesterton isn't just arguing utility in his Apologia for Christianity, but that's a separate issue and a separate topic. So yeah, how do we get here? We have torn down the fence of normalcy. And there is no semi-universal standard to cling to anymore. It's anything goes. And in the wake of that, which leads us to our second point, people then attempt to find new things to cling to. But why? Well, a lot of religious people will tell you that man has an inherent urge to be religious, which is to say to strive for the numinous. Man is, in the eyes of many, homo religiosus, the religious being. And I think there's some truth to that. And I wouldn't be the first person to point this out, and many others who have observed this, that many of the qualities and characteristics of wokeness and the people who become embroiled in it all often seem to take on a religious character and hue. But... I don't think it's just that. I don't think it's just this idea that humans are religious beings. But I think more important to all of this, given the lassitude of standards as they exist or rather don't exist today, is another term that I might use, although it doesn't have as much currency, it'll be the term homo communalis, the communal or social being. I think far more important than this desire for the numinous, the spiritual, is this desire to belong. In fact, this has been relatively well studied in areas of, say, the southern and midwestern United States, and it seems a much stronger factor than sincere religious belief, which is to say, in spread out communities where people don't know each other, churches and church congregations and religiosity in general serves as the glue that binds people together in the form of communities. And so when you lose standards that you can no longer orient yourself towards, then you begin searching because humans are social. Humans are, to some degree, communal. There's variation, obviously. And on the far end of any of these spectrums, you're going to have people who aren't social at all, who really, really enjoy solitude and the hermetic existence, and other people are the embodiment of extroversion and sociability. But most people fall somewhere in between. And indeed, especially children, need social interaction with each other and with people in general. And the key factor of religion, as I mentioned in the case of the southern or midwestern United States, is that it, it does serve as a glue that binds people together. And looking for that community and looking for that social aspect, a lot of these wacky ideas, and they are wacky, that people identify as cats, or as they identify as certain other things as well, we won't go into that, that comes from, I think, ultimately, a desire to belong to something. Again, a very banal and insignificant observation. Back in the day, you had quote-unquote normalcy, but you also had other things that people could orient themselves towards. Maybe it would be a club or something like that. Some place they could actually belong. But that's not sufficient anymore. Why? Because the overarching sense of what we consider a standard that we can all adhere to is gone. 
Back then, you had certain standards. You tried to adhere to them, even if you were a bit deviant. And on the side, you could be part of the D&D club, if such a thing existed, or the racquetball club, or whatever, play local sports. That would give you that sense of belonging. But with the disappearance of normalcy and standards, people start looking for other identities that will serve as glue for their social needs and their desire to belong. And this is why this is not going to recede anytime soon. No longer are there standards of normalcy. And let's be honest, sometimes in the past, we would chafe under these standards of normalcy. They were annoying and irritating. But I don't think letting go of all of them and any semblance of normalcy has been a very good solution to all of this. I think, if anything, it sent us into a spiral of chaos. And Generation Z and Generation Alpha, in particular Generation Alpha, is going to feel the full force of this. Z has felt it for a while, but Alpha, having been born in the 2010s going forward, has entered a world that is topsy-turvy and makes absolutely no sense. Generation Alpha, in particular, is a generation that, before they were sucking on a pacifier, probably had a tablet or an iPhone in their hand. And all puns aside, maybe that's even true in some cases. So there's no getting around this. This is the future. And it's going to be a very, very confusing future. I always say when people ask me, would you like to be born Gen Z or Generation Alpha? Absolutely not. I mean, sure, I would like to be young. I would like to have the powers of youth because getting old sucks. But the generation itself, the era, the technology, no. Anyway, thank you for tuning in as always. Can you please leave a like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. And if I'm still alive, I will check you out later. May the gods watch over you. And you take care. Bye-bye. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.